it undergoes a phase transition. Undergoes a phase transition. So what does it mean? It means that there is a drastic change of behavior at some beta, okay? And this change is gonna be as follows. So theorem for every d larger or equal to two, there exists a beta c, which by the way, depends on the dimension, okay? But the important thing is that it's not zero and it's not infinity. So it's strictly between zero and infinity such that the magnetization, which is nothing else than sigma zero plus beta, okay? It's the average of the spin at zero. This thing is either zero if beta is smaller than beta C, and it's strictly positive if beta is larger than beta C. So we get back to the question of Philip, which is that you see if beta is larger than beta C, you have symmetry breaking. The average of the spin at zero is no longer zero. But actually this symmetry breaking disappear below a certain inverse temperature, where there you recover symmetry breaking in the infinite volume, uh, in the infinite volume limit, okay? So this is a theorem and this theorem is so this is a theorem is a combination of two results. First, it's Peirce's result that tells you that when beta is small, well, this was even known before, but when beta is small, you don't have symmetry breaking. The magnetization is zero. But pairs prove that when beta is large, you have symmetry breaking. So the magnetization is strictly positive. And if you combine that to a monotonicity result, for instance, from Griffiths, you really have the existence of this beta C as the infimum of the betas for which the magnetization is positive. So Griffiths is kind of telling you that as soon, I mean, M of beta is a known decreasing function. So there is a smallest beta where it's known, I mean, there, there is an infimum of the beta for which is non-zero, and for every beta larger, it is strictly positive. Okay, let me tell you a little bit. You see, if you define beta C like that, you see that it doesn't tell you what happens at criticality, at beta C. Uh, sigma zero is the spin at zero. So you see here, sigma X is a spin at X. So zero being a vertex of ZD, sigma zero is just a spin at zero, okay? So, as I was saying, when beta tends, I mean, when beta is equal to beta C, the definition of beta C as the infimum of the beta for which the magnetization is strictly positive doesn't provide you information on what happens at beta C. But there is a result which tells you that in fact, here you can put less or equal to zero. When uh, less or equal to beta C, when beta is equal to beta C, the magnetization is zero. And this is gonna be an important feature for us. Okay, so this result of having no magnetization at zero, uh, at beta C, sorry about that, uh, it has a long history in D equal two, this is due to Onzager. For D larger or equal to four, it's a result by Eisenman. So Onzager, it's in 44. Then there is a result by Eisenman and Fernandez for the dimension d larger or equal to four, which is maybe 86, something like that. And d equals three, which was the remaining case, and you are gonna see that dimension three is a difficult dimension. d equals three is a result by Eisenman, myself, and Sidoravicius from uh, 2015. This is just for your culture, just to know that the phase transition of the Ising model is always continuous. Okay, and when you have a continuous phase transition, well, many questions appear and appear natural at this stage. For instance, you would like to understand what we call critical exponents. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them because I'm gonna need the definitions of these critical exponents later. Um, 
a second question that you can look at, so the critical exponents are going to tell us how uh, thermodynamical quantities vary when beta approaches beta c or when beta is equal to beta c. So these critical exponents in physics, they pop up everywhere and they describe if you want the phase transition. But there is a second question that you can ask is how sigma x, x in uh, plus or minus one to the zd, how does this thing look like as a distribution, if you want, when you integrate it against smooth functions? So how, I mean, how this does, I mean, how does, okay. Look as a distribution. And this is actually gonna be the subject of this, uh, these lectures, at least in dimension four and more. We are gonna prove that when you integrate smooth functions against the, the field, sigma x, against the spin configuration, you end up with things that looks roughly Gaussian. And the bigger and the bigger averages you make, the more and more Gaussian you look. And this is a property that is true only in dimension four and more, and that's why I'm discussing this dimension in this, uh, these lectures. Okay, but before I tell you the exact statement, don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you with this kind of uh, sh shaky uh, um, statement. Before I do that, I want to discuss a little bit the critical exponents, first for your culture and also again, because in the statement of uh, our uh, main result, we will use quantities like the susceptibility, the correlation length that I would like you to know already, so I'm gonna define them in the context of telling you a little bit of history of the first question, okay? So this was, by the way, uh, probably the fourth. I'm not gonna to manage to keep track of this, but I will try nonetheless. So first thing, critical exponents. So what are critical exponents and what do we know about them? So first thing, as I defined it like that, there is a natural question is to pick beta larger or equal to beta c and to look at the magnetization m of beta and to look how it decays when beta tends to beta c. So I told you that m of beta is a continuous function at beta c, it tends to zero. But in fact, the prediction is that it tends to zero, so it's zero below zero, of course, it tends to zero as an uh, um, algebraic quantity, and the physicists didn't find a better notation than called the exponent beta, which I'm really sorry about. So to try to make it a little bit less confusing, I'm gonna call it beta bar, to avoid to have too many betas. But it's predicted that it should decay like that, plus little of one, okay? So this should be the decay when beta tends to beta c. This is when beta tends to beta c, okay? And beta bar, there is a prediction for beta bar, and it should be equal to one over eight if d is equal to two. And actually it's known that it's equal to that. There is a quantity, when d equal to three, which is only obtained by numerical analysis, there is no algebraic formula for it and probably nobody believes that there is a special, uh, I mean, there is all, I mean, of course there are always people believing everything. So, but I mean, the majority of the people probably don't believe that there is a specific value in dimension three. And in dimension four and more, beta should be one half, okay? And this, I want you to remember that for any dimension larger or equal to four, it should be one half. There is a, I mean, this is typical. You see, you define the thermodynamical quantity, the magnetization, and you look how it decays when beta tends to beta c. But it's not the only quantity you can look at. So for instance, there is another quantity which is very natural, which is rather well-defined when beta is smaller than beta c, which is called the susceptibility. So the susceptibility is what? It's by definition, 
the sum for every vertices in ZD of sigma zero, sigma x, beta. Okay, you take the spin-spin correlation, you sum over every, you fix uh, one spin to be the origin, and you sum over every other vertices. Okay, by the way, it's absolutely unclear that this is finite, but it's predicted that indeed it is when beta is smaller than beta c, and it should decay like one over beta minus beta c. Maybe let's put an absolute value. To the gamma plus little of one. So maybe I should stay with the gamma. So gamma plus little of one. Okay, so when again beta tends to beta c. So this again is called the susceptibility. I want you to keep this name in mind because I'm going to use it probably without really paying attention. So I'm trying to define quantities that I will probably use without paying attention, and I want you to understand what they are. So susceptibility is the, the sum of all the spins. And gamma, again, has a specific prediction. And it should be equal to uh, one, uh, so let me remember, seven fourths if d is equal to two. Again, some value when d is equal to three. And in higher dimension, it should be simply equal to one. And this, I think I would maybe even prove it just because we are going to develop tools that are going to give us this result in no time. So that's also why I think it was nice to tell you a little bit about this thing. So gamma equal one in dimension four and more, it's not very difficult to get. Okay. Third question. There is another quantity that is interesting, is when beta is smaller than beta c, it's called the correlation length. And this one, I really needed to define my, uh, I mean, to, to state my full result. So the correlation length is defined as the limit when n tends to infinity of minus n over log of sigma zero, sigma of n zero, zero. So you go just, and n steps in one direction. You look at the spin-spin correlation and you look at the rate of decay if you want. So this is kind of saying that sigma zero, sigma n zero up to zero is like e to the minus n over psi of beta, roughly speaking, in the sense that you get plus, I mean, in the power plus the total of one. Okay, so it's roughly like that. So this correlation length, so that's called correlation length. This correlation length, again, has no reason, reason to be uh, finite, but in fact it is. And one expects that this behaves like one of the beta minus beta c to the new, so yet another algebraic decay. And the new, again, as before, is having a predicted value. And this predicted value is going to be 1 if d is equal to 2. Again, no clue if d is equal to 3. And in higher dimension, it should be 1 half. Uh, 4, sorry. And again here, notice that you have the same value for every d large or equal to four. I'm not gonna make a full list of everything, but I want to tell you about the last quantity, sorry about that, not that, which is a little bit different. So if you pick beta equal beta c, there is another critical exponent that you can be interested in, is to look how fast sigma zero sigma x decays. So again, we are at beta c now. And this is predicted to decay like one over x to the d minus two plus eta. Don't ask me why people write it. I mean, maybe ask me why. Um, the people write this power like that. It's because you are gonna see a reference point is uh, d minus two. d minus two is a natural decay and I'm gonna go back to that in a second, okay? So they write it d minus two plus an exponent eta, 
And this exponent eta, so again, plus the total of one, this exponent eta here, this should, okay, maybe that's not readable anymore. This exponent eta has a predicted value. which is uh, one quarter if d is equal to two. Again, no clue in dimension three except some numericals. And it's zero if d is larger or equal to four. Okay? So this, by the way, I'm gonna get back to that in the remarks in the next slide, but this d larger or equal to four, be, this exponent being zero is gonna be absolutely crucial. And we really want to understand what that means, okay? Okay, so these are the statements of the different quantity. Are the critical exponents known to exist when their value are not known? No, I don't know any case where these exponents are known to exist without being actually computed. What is interesting is that there are results, not in dimension four and more, but uh, maybe, maybe even in dimension four and more. There are results relating them, or if you want, relating the different quantities to each other. So even though you don't necessarily know the existence of these exponents, you can sometimes get scaling relations between them, connections between them. But there are very few cases where you know, at least for the easing model, there is no cases where you know how to prove existence of the exponent without actually computing it. Okay? Okay, so... Let me make a few remarks on this list of, uh, of exponents. So first thing is that, and this is probably the most important thing, that's why I put it first, is that for d larger or equal to four, if you look at the list, you always get the same exponents. So those exponents are all the same as soon as you are above four. And in fact, they are also the same as what you would get if you consider the curie vice model, so the model on the complete graph. So for d larger or equal to four, these quantities take what, they call, what we call their mean field value, meaning the values that you would get from curie vice. Okay? So it's something very robust in statistical mechanics, which is that if you are on a sufficiently large model, uh, you get, uh, um, if you are on sufficiently large lattice, you get the mean field values. So uh, Peter is mentioning that they are bounds. So of course they are bounds, that's true. But uh, maybe one should write them not in terms of eta, even though, I mean, uh, Peter is rightful to write it like that, but. I mean, they are bound on the original quantity, sigma zero, sigma x. But you cannot really prove the existence of eta. Okay. Uh, no, no, but it's very good, Peter. That's a very good comment. Okay. Um, second thing is that in order to define, actually, let me put this, the susceptibility here or the correlation length, well, you need a fairly rapid decay of correlation when beta is strictly smaller than beta c. And in fact, this is a result that for any beta smaller than beta c, there exists a constant c, which depends on beta, actually, and also on d, but this is not so important, such that the spin-spin correlations are smaller than exponential of minus c times x. Okay, so that means that as soon as you are below correlation length, you decay exponentially fast. Okay, this actually gives automatically a good definition for the susceptibility because that means that sigma zero, sigma x is summable. But that also gives a good definition for uh, the correlation length because, and this is gonna be the subject of the next exercise, which I write here. So exercise two, so prove that psi, I mean, this is not B, this is A, A is the first letter of the alphabet. Prove that psi of beta exists by proving 
that sigma zero sigma n plus k zero zero beta is larger or equal to sigma zero sigma n zero etc beta sigma sigma k zero beta okay there is a super multiplicativity of the seconds and this is a simple fact to deduce from it that the susceptibility uh, the correlation length exists by the way again same disclaimer as for exercise one if you don't know anything about the easing model you don't have the material to prove that yet you will have the material the tools to prove that at the end of wednesday's lecture okay so don't try now if you never heard about griffith's inequality for instance okay and by the way there is also a result that one can get thanks to what we will prove on Wednesday, which is that psi of beta tends to infinity as beta tends to beta c. And in fact, chi of beta tends to infinity as beta tends to beta c. Okay? So these guys diverge, which is coherent with the fact that here we had decays, right? I mean, the gamma, sorry. The gamma and the nu were positive. So we had blow up of these quantities and this can be proved rigorously. So this is the subject of this exercise. By the way, the proof of this result that you have exponential decay, it's due to Eisenman. I mean, Michael is gonna appear everywhere. So let me put A when it's Michael. Eisenman, Barsky, and Fernandez. in 88 and there is another proof by myself and Vincent Tassion that maybe I recommend to take a look at because it's shorter in 2016 I guess or something like that okay so all these quantities they are well defined and what I want you to remember from this discussion is that spin spin correlations decay very fast as soon as beta is strictly smaller than beta c so all the type of convergence issues that you could uh, uh, see coming in uh, the quantities I'm going to define later, they do not exist as soon as beta is smaller than beta c because everything decays super fast. By the way, this is for your culture, for beta larger than beta c, so you know that sigma zero sigma x beta, in some sense, you, you can easily get that uh, Ah, okay. Well, Tal, I'm going to exactly uh, answer your question, maybe. So when beta is larger than beta c, the spin-spin correlations, it's easy to prove that they converge when x goes to infinity to the magnetization squared. So they don't tend to zero at all. But what you can do is introduce the truncated correlation, which physicists write like that, which is by definition by definition, sigma zero, sigma x beta minus magnetization squared. So this quantity tends to zero when beta tends to beta c. And in fact, it tends to zero very fast. So this is smaller than exponential of minus constant x. And by the way, as soon as you have this decay, you can even prove the existence of the correlation length in supercritical by taking the truncated correlations instead of taking the untruncated ones. And by the way, it's a little bit surprising, at least it was surprising to me, that this result was not known until very recently. So it's a paper by myself, Goswami and Raufi from 2018. And it was, uh, I mean, it was surprisingly difficult to get. So that was just, uh, mentioned and many results actually that I'm going to state extend or should extend to the supercritical regime to the regime beta larger than beta c okay um, last questions I want to mention what I mean 
when these exponents are known. So in dimension d equal two, all the results, so the, uh, I mean, all the exponents, meaning beta, gamma, nu, and eta, are all known. And this has been uh, one of the most beautiful stories, I mean, success story of, of uh, modern statistical physics to derive all the critical exponents of the two-dimensional easing model, okay? I'm talking nearest neighbor on the square lattice, getting these exponents in general for any planar lattice is not that easy. Uh, is the existence of psi of beta in is also only for, no, it's for any dimension, Andras. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, I have a good angel, good. That's, uh, um, in dimension three, it's purely conjectural. I mean, well, first, I don't know, I mean, they are not even conjectures. I mean, it's, it's open, but I should mention for people who are interested that there is a very interesting body of works that, uh, I mean, emerged in the last 10 years, which is uh, known under the name of conformal bootstrap. And uh, these people, they are extremely smart uh, physicists who use combination of um, Monte Carlo simulations of uh, numerical analysis and of conformal field theory to try to get very sharp estimates on these exponents. And it's an absolutely outstanding uh, body of quarks. It's non-rigorous, but it's very impressive. And it's very interesting once, I mean, you have a certain body of axioms that we don't manage to prove as mathematicians, but starting from these axioms, what they do is rigorous and it's very, very interesting. Uh, I will, uh, uh, soon we are gonna make the break. I just finished this page. So in dimension four and more, all these, I mean, two of these exponents are known, namely beta and gamma. So the exponent for the susceptibility and the exponent for the magnetization, okay? And I want to highlight that. So this is a result by Eisenman and Fernandez because there is a little bit, let's say, a gentle confusion in, I mean, it's not easy in the literature to recover what is known or not. So in particular, in dimension five and more, you will see that many things were, that I'm gonna discuss this week were already known in the 80s, but convergence of say the spin-spin correlation is not known. It was not known at the time and it's still not known. So the exponents eta and nu, so the exponent for the rate of decay of spin-spin correlation and the exponent for uh, the correlation length are still open in high dimension, okay? Even in dimension five. They are known when D is very, very large. When D is extremely large, you can do less expansion, which is just a buzzword that you don't need to know. And Sakai proves, I mean, derives exponents eta and nu, okay? Let me conclude by a last comment and we make a break. Is that there is something which is known in any dimension Okay, and which is very, very, very important. It's gonna be crucial for us and I want you to remember this. It's called the infrared band. Maybe let me not do this like that, infrared band. It's due to Frölich and Spencer, even though uh, what I'm gonna write is not quite following from Frölich and Spencer, but you can derive it from Frölich and Spencer using what we call the messager mirac soleil inequality. And it says that sigma zero, in fact, even the truncated thing, but think of sigma zero, sigma x, is always bounded by two over beta times the green function for every x in ZD and for every beta. Maybe strictly positive because otherwise this quantity doesn't make sense. So this is the random walk green function. The expected number of visits 
of a random walk starting at zero, uh, the expected number of visits at x. Not that in dimension two it's infinite, but then I mean my quantity is, I mean my inequality is trivially uh, right, it's just uh, useless. Okay, so if we reuse the notation in some sense of Peter of inequalities between exponents, this is saying that eta is larger or equal to two. The worst thing that could happen here is this. Right, the, the green function decays like one over x to the d minus two. So that's why physicists write it d minus two plus a defect, plus a defect exponent eta. And what we will know and we will use very heavily is that in fact, sigma zero sigma x is always smaller or equal to a constant divided by x to the d minus two. And in fact, my assumption of regularity in uh, lecture three will exactly be that sigma zero sigma x decays like the green function, that up to constant, it is like one over x to the d minus two. It is what is predicted in dimension four and more because I told you that eta should be zero, but it's not known. And what I will not be doing in these lectures is explain to you what you do when you don't have this assumption, which is a very big assumption, okay? But you will see that already you will have a glimpse at the result just under this assumption. So uh, that has been 50 minutes, I mean 55. Even. So let's make a 15 minute break and resume with statements of the theorems and discussion of the results. Okay. In, in the meantime, if uh, anyone has any question, they can write in the chat or if you raise your hand, then we can unmute you and you, you can perhaps ask a uh, question to Hugo yourself. So Hugo, one question we had, um, was from Hapert about a good recom good good um, good reference for the whole all of these d equal to two results. Well, it's always a little bit uh, problematic because there are uh, millions of ways of getting it now, and it depends very much on the tastes of uh, the reader. So, do you like you know to think more in terms of dimers and uh, use dimers as much as possible and use the bosonization rule that gives you uh, the spin spin uh, i mean all the exponents for uh, for easing do you prefer exact integrability uh, like um, 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 how should i say like a conformal invariance type uh, results so then you should read more things by uh, stas smirnov and his co-authors uh, it, it's, it's a difficult answer. Uh, I don't think there is a very good, for instance, I don't, I never saw an elementary presentation of, uh, of the Onzager uh, original article. So Onzager in his original article, he, he proves, he gets uh, an exact formula for the free energy of the model, which doesn't give you any of the exponents I mentioned, but which allows you uh, to have a first step towards them. And even that, there is no uh, very good uh, review of, of this result. So, uh, I mean, there are many places where you can find alternative derivations, but the original thing did not. So it's not so uh, easy to find uh, this. Um, there is, of course, a book on exact integrability by like Mikoy and Vu, where all these things would be but it's a difficult book it's not uh, an easy book to get uh, but at least it presents a full story from one side one uh... ah, okay so this i didn't know ah well in german okay that's why i knew i should have uh, learned german better at school but uh, so if you speak german uh, <laughs> uh, then you are fine but otherwise, uh, I don't have a very good. So we are planning on writing a book on easing overall because there is no overview book on easing, which is kind of uh, a mystery why this is happening. Since you can easily write 2,000 pages on the easing model and uh, barely uh, scratch the surface of what is known. But uh, for now, I don't uh, have very good uh, review uh, to give you up. Um, if you want a little bit of idea on the conformal invariant side, there is a review that we wrote with uh, Stas Mirnov, uh, which is 
giving an idea of conformal invariance, but not really the, the critical exponent. Um, yeah, the notes will be, I will send them to Henrik. Oh, okay, Henrik already uh, replied. And that's all, good. So your lecture is too clear, Hugo. People are uh, happy without asking questions. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the reason, but uh, <laughs> keep telling me that it's nice. <laughs> yeah. For people who think it's going too fast, I'm, I apologize, but I think I need to find some uh, balance between, I, mean, I still need to advance because it's not completely elementary material that we are going to reach. On the other hand, for people who think I'm, gonna, I'm going too slow, don't worry, it's going to go faster later. So I mean, I'm... Uh, going like that and uh, it will take speed momentum we will naturally get momentum with uh, the addition of of, um, of the knowledge that we are getting right now so uh, there was a question there just to make sure in d equal to three eta is known to be bigger than zero strictly no i mean if uh, strictly is actually a very interesting question and i like this question quite a lot i thought a little bit about it but we don't even know how to prove. I mean, it's, it's a little bit frustrating. I think maybe it's known that all the exponents in 3D cannot together take their mean field value, but it's not known that a single one doesn't take it. And in fact, uh, like if I tell you, okay, prove that eta is strictly positive, I don't know how to do. And also I think that the results telling you that you cannot have i mean that everybody cannot be in their mean field value it would be like very strong condition maybe that it's up to constant equal to one over x to the d minus two that it's up to constant equal to blah blah which even in dimension four is not necessarily known i mean not necessarily true so so i i think that dimension three you have two sides i mean you can try to hope for the best and there the best would really be uh, hoping a lot, which would be that there are actually formula for the, for the critical exponents and that you can get them. This, I personally don't believe it's the case just because I, f I find it nicer if it's not the case. But um, so this would be the very like optimistic side, but you can also just try to prove that things don't happen like in high dimensions. And these, these are tractable questions, probably, but they are still very difficult. And I, uh, so you will see when I will talk about Gaussianity, there is a very natural question, which is prove non Gaussianity in 3D. And this also, I don't know how to do. So there are all this set of questions on 3D, which is to try to prove really like non trivial inequalities. And that, that, looks, uh, that looks like very interesting questions. I, I, I was raised in the in the percolation community, and that was my uh, my bread and butter. And uh, in in 3D in percolation, you don't know the phase transition is continuous. You already have this big like uh, rock blocking the entrance in some sense. In, in easing, you know the phase transition is continuous, so you have many other questions that you can ask after that. And uh, I think people don't think enough about these questions. I'm sure that as probabilists, we can find inequalities, we can find them. For instance, there is this question that I love completely, which is try to prove that the bubble diagram, which I will define in, in, sec, in uh, the third lecture, that the bubble diagram diverges in 3D. Because this will kind of give you something like eta smaller than one half or something like that, which would be a non-trivial inequality. And you want to say, if you know less expansion, you want to say that if the bubble diagram is finite, then in fact, you should have a behavior like the green function. But if you are like the green function, then the bubble diagram should be infinite. There are, there are many very interesting questions. And uh, I really encourage people to try because if people don't try, nobody succeeds. I mean, that's, uh, but here, like easing is really a nice area for that 3D easing. So perhaps a trivial thing, perhaps uh, some of the literature that you mentioned, even if you say it's not uh, comprehensive, perhaps you could just send us some references and we can then upload, upload them to the web page later. Yeah, 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 good. Yes, I can do that. Okay. 
So I mean, maybe I can just write it here. And since I'm gonna give you the link, so here are known, here definitely one book that will contain all the exponents is uh, a book by Mike Hoy and Vu. It's called e e 2D Easing Model or something like that. I mean, uh, so it, it's easily, I mean, you can easily find it. It's kind of the Bible when you think integrable 2D easing model. And another reference maybe for a review on kind of more recent uh, results and with, I mean, which contains a lot of, of references in it. If you prefer the conformal invariance type results, I mean, approach to the critical exponents, you have a review by myself and Stas Smirnov, which you can easily find on my webpage, for instance. I think that's probably, uh, uh, I mean, the only thing I wrote only with Stas except for the self holding work paper. So you cannot confuse, that's my point. So perhaps, are we ready to go again? I am. It's so as everybody else is muted and can't complain, perhaps you just exactly, go. Exactly, so that's perfect. I like this kind of uh, control that we have <laughs> right now. Uh, okay. Um, so let's keep going. So from now, I want, this is not, I mean, okay, I don't know, I don't know how to count apparently. So on my uh, notes, it's six, so okay. Maybe I'm just going to stop humiliating myself. So I told you about critical exponents. Now let me tell you about large scale averages and state our main results. So large scale averages. Okay, so the idea here is we want to see sigma x, the, the, the spin configuration as a random field. So define the average against this random field. So we are going to fix beta and L. So beta is uh, a priori going to be any positive number and L is going to be an integer. Okay? Positive integer. Maybe even strictly positive, otherwise things will make no sense. Okay. And let's define for every function, uh, for every F, which is a continuous function, a compact support on RD. Okay, so continuous and compactly supported. Define T of F L beta of sigma to be the following. It's gonna be the one over a renormalization. Let me give that later. But the important thing is that it's the sum over x in Zd of f of x divided by L times sigma x. So you average sigma x against a rescaled ver risk version of your function f. Okay, so here you should really think that another way of putting it is that you rescale your lattice by a factor one over L and then you average f of y against sigma of y, where sigma is the guy, uh, the vertices of your rescale lattice, okay? And I want to rescale the whole thing that somehow uh, it doesn't blow up. So I'm gonna rescale by square root of sigma L of beta, where sigma L of beta is by definition the following, it's the average of sum of sigma x squared for x in the box of size L. Or if you want, it's a sum over x and y in lambda L of sigma x, sigma y, beta. So lambda L is maybe let me even, actually I don't think I'm gonna need this notation so much. So let me be even gentler and put minus L, L to the T. I guess the fewer notations, the better we feel. Okay, so this is the definition of the average of f against my field sigma. Actually, it's a rescale version of sigma. Why do I rescale it? I rescale it because you notice that then, if I look, for instance, at, uh, if I look at, 
TFL beta of sigma squared, and I look at F, which is the indicator function of minus one to the D, then this is exactly one, right? I rescaled it exactly so that when I look at F, which is indicator function of the cube, the unit cube, I get a hypercube, sorry, I get one. Okay, so it's a fairly natural rescaling. You can choose another one if you want. Any kind of natural rescaling would give the same result anyway. Okay, so that's the rescaling. And by the way, at least if you take F, which is positive, you are gonna get that this guy should be of order one, where order here depends on F. Of course, if you take F, uh, if you multiply F by six, then this quantity is multiplied by uh, uh, six squared. I mean, the variance is multiplied by, uh, by 36. Um, but in general, the variance, I mean, the rescaling is made in such a way that you get roughly order one variance for this random variable. Huh? Notice that this is a random variable. It's very important to notice that, okay? It's a random variable. Okay, so it's a random variable. How does it look? And the result, first result that I will discuss, which is not due to me, it's due to Eisenman in 82, and in the same time to Frölich, the same year by different means. What they proved is that in fact, this is roughly Gaussian. It's a Gaussian random variable. In the following sense, it says that fix d larger or equal to five, okay? If you fix d larger or equal to five, then for any beta larger than beta c, uh, smaller, sorry, than beta c, I will comment on this assumption later, okay? For any l smaller than the correlation length, and for any function f compactly supported, then, I mean, how can I measure if I'm close or not to, uh, to a Gaussian random variable, what I can do is I can look at the generating function of this, uh, of this random variable. Okay, so I look at this for the round against uh, beta. So I look at the average of e to the z, blah, blah, where z is, uh, maybe let me write it like that, for every z belonging to c. And what they prove is that this is e to the z squared over two times the variance. Exactly what you would get if you are a Gaussian, except it's not exactly Gaussian, but it's close to be Gaussian in the sense that it's one plus big O of, of what? of, well, an error term, and this error term doesn't have, I mean, it's not so important how it looks. The important thing is that it decays, and it decays like L to the D minus four here. Okay, so what are these terms that I wrote here, these barbaric terms? This is just the soup norm. Okay, and RF is a range. So I'm compactly supported. So I need to be zero after some radius. So this is the max of the, a, of the R such that there exists X with uh, X equal to R and uh, F of X non-zero. Okay, so F is zero outside of the ball of size R of F. So this guy, Forget, I mean, I don't think this is so important. Okay, you can forget them. Maybe I should not write it like that, but you can forget them. The important thing is the bigger the L, the closer to one, the closer to the characteristic function you are, or to the generating function you are of a Gaussian. Okay, so this result is really telling you nothing else than if L is large, then T 
f l sigma beta of sigma is roughly a Gaussian random variable of variance where the variance of t f l sigma. Okay, so here the consequence. Don't worry, I'm going to rewrite this thing a second time because I mean that's the main theorem. So I want you really to understand it. Sorry, uh, as much as possible. So here it really says. when d is larger or equal to five, t f l beta of sigma is roughly a Gaussian random variable. And the variance, of course, is the variance of the variable, okay? So it's roughly Gaussian. So the large scale averages are Gaussian. And here, this is never really Gaussian, but it's more and more Gaussian when l tends to infinity. Okay, so this is uh, okay. Um, so that's the original result. As we said here, it's beta smaller or equal to beta c, and it's for correlation length uh, for l smaller than correlation length. Maybe at this stage, ignore that and just think if beta is equal to beta c. We did mention that the correlation length is going to infinity, so it's going to be equal to infinity at beta c. So just think of this, this assumption that beta is smaller, uh, L is smaller than, than the correlation length. Just think of it as being an empty assumption when beta is equal to beta c. Just when beta is smaller than beta c, it's a useful condition. The reason being that when you are larger than beta c, you start to look actually even uh, like a, uh, I mean, like a trivial uh, white noise. So it's not interesting. Actually, you could still write a result, but I don't want to be focusing on that. Um, okay, there were a few questions. This means that the tails decay pretty fast, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, is it possible to see from this conversion to a Gaussian field as a random distribution? Yes, it is possible. And actually, that's what we get. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. What are we gonna, so this is from 82. Now what waited for 40 years? So what waited for 40 years is the generalization or, or the extension rather to the D equal four. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute why it's not just trying to play and, and get one more dimension, why it's very important to get dimension four in some sense. And there, the result is the same, except you, uh, so there is a constant such that for any beta smaller than beta c, for any L smaller than the correlation length, for any F which is compactly supported on RD, when I look, I know I'm repeating the same thing as before, but I guess it's not too much to have it a second time. So you get z square over two t f l beta of sigma squared beta. And you get again one plus big O. You get the same error. I, I write it again, but this is really not important. Again, this you can think of just a constant here that depends on f and on z. That's all. Just think of that. But here, the important thing is that it's rescale this time by log of l to the c. So c is a small constant. We prove the existence of a small constant. So you have a logarithmic logarithmically flat, uh, fat decay to zero. Before it was polynomial, now it's logarithmic. But it does imply the same result, which is that it looks roughly Gaussian. So that's the statement that we are gonna try to prove this week. And in particular, try to understand this log. Why is there this log to some power? And why in a higher dimension it's rather uh, a polynomial decay. Okay. Um, 
sorry, yeah. but uh, it means that you cannot really take L to infinity, right? What do you mean? Because it's you write that it's bounded by psi of beta. Ah, uh, you don't want to be taking L to infinity when beta is not equal to beta c, to beta c. When beta is equal to beta c, you want to take L to infinity to get the scaling limit. That's what I will be discussing in a minute. Uh, when beta is not equal to beta c, it's actually used, actually it's very coherent with what I'm going to write. So let me come back to your interesting question in a second. Okay. So as it was mentioned several times uh, in, the, I mean, in the, I mean, maybe only once, but is it possible to see it as a, oh, maybe let me answer first Tal's question. Is there a meaningful comparison of different betas? Uh, I'm going to, I mean, you are going to see that actually the truth is that you can take, I mean, there are joint limits that are interesting. Uh, I'm going to do it just in a minute. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you would like to understand the process as a generalized Gaussian distribution, as a Gaussian free field, for instance. And that's what is expected. So what you expect is that TFL of sigma squared beta which, by the way, if you rescale it, I mean, if you rewrite it, it's equal to this, right? It's equal to f of x over l, f of y over l, and then you get sigma x, sigma y, beta. You expect this to be decaying like a, a variance times the double integral of u and v of f of u, f of v, times the green function between u and v, du dv, but not the general green function. Here, you expect to have a massive green function, and the mass should depend on the ratio between L and psi of beta. In which sense, so this, is, this guy is a massive green function. It should be that when L is much smaller than the correlation length, then this M is almost zero. Okay, so in particular, this result should tell you that if Ln beta N tends to infinity beta C with Ln much smaller than psi of beta N, so in particular, you could fix beta n equal beta c for every n. So you fix the temperature and you let n go to infinity. If you do that, then you expect, you expect convergence to GFF, to the Gaussian free field. But here, you see, in order to get to do that, you need to understand how this thing is scaling. And you need to prove that this thing is basically scaling like the correlation length, uh, like the green function. So this should be like constant times green function. And this is open. We don't know how to prove that. So this is, oh, no, that's not a good way of writing. Let's put it like that. Can I? Yeah, that's, that's gonna be impressive. Open, yeah. So, we don't know how to prove convergence to the Gaussian free field, okay? If you want, we know how to prove convergence. Uh, we know that any subsequential limit is gonna be a Gaussian uh, generalized, uh, a generalized Gaussian distribution, but we don't know the variance. We don't know how to uh, identify the covariance of this process, okay? We expect it to be the Gaussian free field, but we don't know how to prove. Now, there is another thing, which is that when L, imagine that you take L, which is of order of a certain lambda times the, green uh, times the correlation length. So imagine Ln beta N tends to infinity beta C with Ln, which is lambda psi of beta N, okay? Then you should converge to massive GFF, and that's what this quantity means. Okay, so to answer Tal's uh, uh, question, the interesting limits in some sense is either to 
have L much smaller than the correlation length. And in this case, in some sense, you look critical and you converse to the massless Gaussian free field. But there is another interesting regime, which is to take L of the order of the correlation length. And then you have also a limit when L tends to infinity. And in fact, in this case, beta tends to beta C. And you end up with massive Gaussian free field. Okay? So they are kind of, uh, and this, this mass here that I, I'm predicting to exist, it's kind of a certain function of L of xi of beta to answer uh, Joe's question. So it's maybe not mass times the L of xi of beta, uh, but it should probably be like L of xi of beta to some power or something like that. Okay? So it's not, yeah, so. It's not exact. I mean, I don't want to enter, and actually, I didn't even think about what is the right function. I just wanted to illustrate informally what is the prediction. This is just prediction again. The fact that this implies that you are roughly Gaussian, that you converge to a Gaussian field, this is true. But identifying the covariance, this is something that is out of our league. Okay, so Peter, do you really expect the two point? Yes, yes, so uh, uh, thank you Roland for answering. So the two point function doesn't have log correction. That's why I think that this proof on Thursday using this regularity assumption that you are of the order of the two point function is an interesting proof because that's what you expect to occur. But then you are gonna see that higher order uh, um, Spin spin correlation, they will have log correction, uh, or as Roland uh, uh, wrote, the susceptibility, the correlation length, the magnetization, all of that have log correction. Okay. Um, uh, yes, yes. There was a, a question just to clarify the supplementation of M. So is it? Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of answer it, but maybe not sufficiently explicitly. Sorry about that. So it's not m times the, the, I don't think it's m times the L over xi of beta. Maybe it is. More generally, I think it's safe to expect m times L over xi of beta to some power. That is probably uh, closer to, uh, and, and is the power one. Maybe Roland knows better than I do this. Uh, I never thought about the question, and I will not be able to do it live like that. Probably. But, uh, in any case, this is completely open, right? I mean, this is really, we are far from understanding this type of things. If you want, I can try to figure out what is the exponents before Wednesday, if I think about it. Okay? Um, okay, so just to, to mention, because we are gonna, so a few comments, maybe a few more remarks. So you, as I said, convergence, to GFF, I mean, okay, first thing maybe, if the, I mean, if you, if the TF, I mean, if LN, beta N are chosen in such a way that uh, one of the square roots sigma L of beta sigma X, if you want, if this guy converges weakly, imagine you, you pick a limit, whatever the way you want, you pick a limit in such a way that you have weak convergence to a random distribution. Then the result is telling you that uh, the limit is necessarily, necessarily, a generalized Gaussian process. So the distribution is Gaussian. But again, and this I want to really be clear because I don't want to overextend, we don't know how to identify the uh, covariance matrix of this uh, process. So we don't know how to identify the covariance matrix. I'm going to get back to that in a minute when we discuss um, another interpretation of the results. There are known results, 
but not for the easing model. Uh, so it's a very, very interesting question to identify it, but just to highlight the fact that this is a non-trivial question, many people tell me, okay, you know, the success of, I mean, the, the progress of the result is to get the four-dimensional result. Even in dimension five, it's not known. We don't know how to prove convergence to GFF because we don't know that the spin-spin correlation behaves like the green function. Okay, we know in high dimension that was this result of Sakai, but we don't know in dimension five. So identifying the covariance is not an issue of dimension four or higher, it's an issue of all these dimensions. It's not, there is no distinction between dimension four and higher. By the way, um, we don't even know that there exists a covariance which is the same for any subsequential limit. So we don't have that there exists a limit. Okay, that's another point. Um, let me mention two other remarks. The first remark is that in, in our lectures, we are gonna prove that in 2D, actually, if you look, say, at, uh, at this uh, limit, I mean, at this quantity, so the variance, I mean, the force power, sorry, of this guy. Well, we can prove it's smaller than twice the variance, which by the way, this we said was one, but we don't need that. We can prove that the force power of this random variable is smaller than twice the second power squared. So what does it tell you? It tells you that you are not Gaussian. You are really not Gaussian, okay? Because otherwise you would like a three instead of a two, okay? So in 2D, you are non-Gaussian. And you are gonna see, once we introduce the random current, this is a very, very, very elementary proof. So there are ways of seeing this by, I mean, full solution of the 2D easing model, blah, 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 things that would take you uh, uh, 500 pages to write, but you have an argument in three lines using the random current. So I will tell you that because I think it's a very beautiful thing. And here, I want to say that in 3D, it should be non-Gaussian, but we don't know how to prove it. And it belongs to this class of questions on the 3D easing model, critical 3D easing model, which are very interesting, but still open. Okay. Um, let me start a little bit the discussion of why is this result interesting and why four dimension? So 1.4, I'm gonna change a little bit my point of view and discuss a constructive. Hugo, uh, before you go, there was a question on yeah. the large scale behavior uh, of the easing model on finite graphs. Okay, let me look at that in a second. Do these results tell us something about the large scale behavior of the model? Yes, yes. You, I mean, all these results have finite volume analogs. So they are finite volume analogs. Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about another point of view on this problem, which comes from constructive field theory. So, I mean, this may look, I mean, I'm guessing maybe I'm gonna lose a few people there. It's not a big deal. It's a completely isolated statement. It's a kind of motivation for the whole week but it's not at all, if you don't understand what I'm gonna say in the next 10 minutes, I mean, last 10 minutes of the, the class, it's not a big deal. So don't panic, don't run away, don't jump through the window, everything is fine. So the goal of constructed field theory is to try to construct averages of, I mean, functional integration things, so averages of the following form. Like, imagine you want to average f of phi exponential of minus h of phi. Now phi is defined on rd. It's a function from rd to r. 
And here I put a product on RD of D phi of X, okay? And where I think of H of phi as being something, and again, here and here, I'm gonna maybe put things like that because you may be panicking. These things don't really make sense per se. You need to make sense of this quantity. So H of phi would be a quadratic form of phi, so this is a quadratic form. And don't worry, you can just think of the integral of Laplacian of phi of x squared dx. Think of that, I'm fine with it, okay? Plus a second part, which is an integral of p of phi of x dx, okay? So h of phi is a physical action. You want to Perhaps this can keep. I didn't get. Uh, okay, so anyway, so you want to make sense of this quantity, and then you want to make sense of this type of integrals. But if you notice quickly, many things are going to be problematic, in particular by, because here you would like, for instance, phi to be c1 to be able to define the gradient. But in fact, typical functions according to this type of Laplacian are not gonna be c1. So when you start defining these quantities, you run into a number of problems of divergences of these integrals, either at small scales or at large scales. Yes, you are right, sorry, thanks. Uh, what I mean, yeah, functional. I mean, f is a function from R to the R to the U. Yes. Um, okay. So, in general, you run into problems, and I want to tell you one example that you know maybe where you uh, don't run into any problems. And this example is a case of p equal to zero. Imagine you don't have this term. Okay, when you don't have this term, it's easy to define a discretization of your model. Meaning what? Meaning imagine you take lambda, a subset of Rd, think of lambda as being, for instance, minus one, one to the D, okay? And fix delta positive. You can define a discrete version of the integral upstairs, which I'm gonna define like that with a delta to, to remind that we are looking at the discretization, which would be one of a norm times the integral of a R to the lambda intersected with delta ZD of F of phi of delta exponential of minus the sum of phi X delta minus phi Y delta squared and here to rescale, I need to put the delta to the D minus two. So imagine I define this, this process. Again, if you are panicking, this is not necessary for the rest of the lectures. So imagine you define this process and notice that this process is absolutely well defined. There is no problem in defining this because I have a finite number, I mean, this quantity here is finite, it's a finite set. So all the integrals are well-defined. If f is a nice function, everything is well-defined. When delta tends to zero, when delta tends to zero, this phi delta converges to a continuum, I mean, to a distribution, a random distribution phi, which is called the GFF. And this phi exactly has a property that when I integrate a smooth function against it, oh, sorry, what happened? That probably, that's my uh, iPad telling me that I'm writing, I mean, that everybody is lost. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So integral over Rd 
of f of x pi of x dx, this thing is behaving like a normal random variable and the variance is exactly f of x, f of y, g of x, y, dx, dy. Okay, so this is the classical convergence result to the Gaussian free field. So in some sense there, you can consider that when you don't have the p, when p is equal to zero, this limiting process that you define as the limit of this random distribution on the, la the, the lattice, that this limit phi is exactly the process making sense of this type of integrals. Okay? Okay, but this process is Gaussian. It's not a very interesting process from the point of view of uh, constructive field theory. So what you would like to do is to change a little bit your uh, P, like to make a P here, which is a little bit less trivial, to try to construct something which is non-Gaussian, okay? So example two, what you could try to do is to define P to be lambda, I mean, to be B X squared plus lambda X to the four. So if you only put B X squared, it's easy to see that you end up with a massive Gaussian free field. So I'm gonna write away, introduce lambda X to the four. And you can again define the phi, which would be a phi of delta, lambda, b, and beta, which would be exactly the same as this guy here, exactly the same as this, but with the new, I mean, instead of the quadratic form in the exponential, with h of phi, which would be minus beta sum of phi x minus phi y squared, exactly like before, but where you add a plus sum of x of b phi x squared plus lambda phi x to the four. I, I'm aware that I'm reaching the end of my lectures, but I'm going to use the four minutes that, uh, uh, I mean, I'm already using it, that Henrik told me because it makes no sense to stop exactly in the middle of this slide. Don't worry, it's going to take five minutes and at least you will have a go home message which makes more sense. So here you add exactly the discretization of this term, okay? And you can ask the same thing. If I take a limit when delta tends to zero, what can I get? Okay? It's interesting because you see, it's kind of a larger family of models and you can take whatever limit you want. Well, the theorem by Michael and myself is that in 4D, any uh, converging limit of a sequence of the form delta n, lambda n, dn, beta n, any limit is necessarily Gaussian. So I'm not saying it's a Gaussian free field, but I'm saying it's necessarily a Gaussian process. And this has a very important consequence from the point of view of constructive quantum field theory, which is that it's a no-go theorem. So quantum, I mean, constructive field theory kind of emerge at the beginning. Now it's a own field of, uh, I mean, it's a field of interest on its own, but at the beginning it emerged as a tool to try to construct quantum field theories, rigorously. So Osterwalder and Osterwalder and Schrader explain that from Euclidean field theories with certain properties, you can recover by a weak rotation, but I mean, let's say by a, you have a black box that gives you automatically a quantum field theory that satisfies the axioms of quantum field theory, at least what are known as Wigman's axioms. And the thing that this, this, uh, this uh, theorem tells you is that if you can construct interesting Euclidean field theories, they automatically translate into interesting quantum field theories. The problem is that they are very uninteresting quantum field theories, which are the trivial ones, the one where 
your particles don't interact with each other. And the problem is that through the mapping of the Oshter-Walder Schrader uh, theorem, it maps into Gaussian processes, Gaussian Euclidean field theory. So if you construct a Gaussian field theory, it gives you a trivial quantum field theory. So this, your game is try to construct non-Gaussian field theories. That's your game. And the thing is that it works very well in dimension two and three. You had uh, highly non-trivial results in dimension two and three uh, by Jaffe and co-authors. Uh, that tells you that you can construct non-trivial quantum field theories. And you will also see in other uh, uh, talks this week that there is a recent resurgence of results on two and three dimension and field theory, like many things with, I, I mean, uh, dynamical results, which are absolutely beautiful. So it works very well in dimension two and three, but bang, in uh, dimension, uh, uh, in 82, Eisenman and Frölich tell you, well, at least if you start from these lattice uh, models, you cannot get anything non-Gaussian in dimension five and more. It's impossible. So this was a big hit because it was starting to hint that in dimension four, it would be the same. And dimension four is the interesting dimension because that's the dimension of Minkowski space. You want three dimension for spatial and one dimension for, for time. But these results, they were falling short of giving you the result in dimension four, the, non, the triviality result in dimension four. So that's our result. Our result is telling you, at least if you start from discretization of, um, I mean, lattice discretization, you necessarily end up with Gaussian processes. So it's a no-go theorem from the point of view of constructive field theory. Let me just conclude with two small comments. I, I promise, Hendrik, Andres, uh, I promise I won't do it again. So the first comment is that here, there is a constraint, so there is a condition on the result, which I'm sure we can get rid of, but it's not that easy, is that you want phi delta n, lambda n, bn, uh, beta n of x, phi of y to tends to zero. So it's a massless process. Uh, I mean, it, sorry, it's a, it's a process which has no ordering, no long range ordering which in the, in, the, in, the, in the reformulation of, of uh, lattice models, it means that uh, you are below the critical point, okay? And the second thing that I want to mention because it's an absolutely beautiful body of works is that if you look at this process here, you notice that if lambda equals zero equals b, you get the GFF. Right, I mean, this thing disappears and you get GFF. On the other hand, if B phi x squared plus lambda phi x to the four is equal to lambda phi x squared minus one squared plus constant. So if you tune B and lambda in a clever way and you let lambda go to infinity, what do you get? This is gonna tell you that phi x squares must be equal to one if lambda tends to infinity. So that means phi x should be equal to plus or minus one. So you should end up with the easing model. So in some sense, these models here, they interpolate between GFF and the easing model. And the easing model is at the farthest away from the GFF. It's the one where really the lambda and the B tend to infinity. So they are the most couple uh, models. Why do I mention that? Because if lambda is small, okay, then you are kind of close to the Gaussian free field. And there are a body of works there by Gavetsky. There is maybe not this D. Gavetsky, Kupiainen. Sorry. Kupiainen. Then by Hara and uh, Takashi, and more recently by Bauer Schmidt, Bridges, and Slade, that tell you that there you converge to GFF. 
So if lambda is small, you have actually much better control of, on what is happening, and you can prove convergence to Gaussian free field. Why did I want to finish on this thing today? It was to try to illustrate one important fact, which is that in the, I mean, this result, this, uh, this result here, they use renormalization to try to prove that uh, when you start from a lattice five form model, you necessarily converge to the Gaussian fifth field, to the fixed point, which is a Gaussian fifth field. So you get more and more Gaussian and then you converge to Gaussian fifth field. And this is something which is perturbative in nature. If you start close to Gaussian free field and you iterate, you end up with Gaussian free field. What I'm telling you is this is on one side of the spectrum. Now go on the completely other side, go to the easing model. There, what we prove is that necessarily we converge to uh, a Gaussian process. We expect somehow that it should even converge to the Gaussian free field. But the thing that we rule out is that it could converge to another fixed point, which will be non Gaussian. But the two types of results are very different. In one case, it's a perturbative result. And on the other side, it's a general result that works for every, like, arbitrarily far from the critical point, uh, from the Gaussian field. So this last 20 minutes at the end, it was not 10 minutes, but this last 20 minutes, they were to try to motivate to you this result on the easing model. It works for five four, and I will mention how it works for five four in the last lecture. But from now on, we are going to forget this section 1.4, which was maybe a little bit difficult to follow. You can completely erase it from your mind. It was a motivation. That's all. And we are going to go back to the easing model on Wednesday and develop tools to try to prove on Thursday our main result. So thank you very much for your patience. And uh, see you on uh, Wednesday. Uh, thank you, Hugo. And let's perhaps... Uh, um Un unmute each other and uh, clap to Hugo to thank him uh, for his uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. It's uh, always awkward to to do that, but uh, we don't have anything else <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so yeah, met, let's ask. Uh, Why is Hugo without video suddenly? I'm without video? Oh, sorry, no, sorry, you were just for a second on my screen, I screwed it up, sorry. I was without video because I was, I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe let me answer the different questions. There are already two questions on the chat. So in order to get an actual interaction, lambda phi four theory in D equal four, one would in person need to choose a different discretization. No, not necessary. No, no. And uh, also I'm, I'm really strongly expecting that if you do smoothing or anything like that, the same type of ideas would work. So we do lattice discretization, but uh, uh, other discretization would also give you uh, something like that. And this discretization, by the way, in, in dimensions three and two, give you lattice uh, phi four with lambda, uh, really with lambda phi four. Do you know that the limiting Gaussian, is, no, uh, no, no, we actually the limiting, the, I mean, you need a lot of things for the limiting distribution. You need an analyticity, for instance, to get uh, the Schroeder axioms. We don't have that. We have continuity of the K, but we don't have analyticity. Uh, you expect it to be the green function, so then it would be fine, but uh, we, we don't have this. In the last part, lambda small, what happens in D larger equal to five? You also get uh, Gaussian free field convergence, but there it's, uh, it's even simpler. Like uh, the D equal four is a much more interesting uh, regime where you are going to get logarithmic corrections and things like that. This uh, Roland Bauer Schmidt knows much better than I do about these things but you also converge to GFF. Yeah. Uh, I do use reflection uh, positivity heavily. Yeah, Trish. So uh, what do you mean by, uh, so this is good, right? I mean, you want reflection yeah, so positivity I, I for the- If you take a different approximation, like a smooth, uh, like a, a Fourier cutoff, you don't have reflection positivity. Ah, no, that's true. I mean, that's true. If you do a, if you do a Fourier cut, well, 
I mean, in general, you don't have. In general, right? I mean, you want. Uh, I mean, I you may be may some... able to. I mean, indeed, you need. Uh, I mean, as a technical step, you need indeed reflection positivity. That's very true, and you are going to see. I mean, for people who never heard about reflection positivity, we are going to at least need the infrared band, and the only way we know how to prove infrared band is through reflection positivity. So one thing I wanted to ask with the OS axioms is it, the limiting Gaussian distribution you get. Do you know, I know you don't know anything about the covariance, but do you know that it's reflection positive or not? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. That I think is uh, surviving the, the limit, yeah. By the way, uh, Teresa took initiative, but now everyone can unmute themselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Amir Ali, in the latest theorem, can we scale of lambda with power of n as well? Uh, you mean, uh, I mean, you can scale lambda n to infinity, yes? Then you are going to converge to, to, to easing, actually. If you scale lambda n to infinity, well, depending on how you scale bn, but you are going to, I mean, the only things you can get is something that is getting closer and closer to, uh, to easing. Or, but uh, yeah, there is no restriction on how you scale lambda n and bn. Zero restriction. It always gives you Gaussian. You cannot escape. Uh, the covariance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, AJ, you are completely right. If you have reflection positivity, so one thing I wanted to have is you see, the thing that you don't get is scale invariance. Scale invariance is not trivial to get at all, but uh, at the same time, physically, scale invariance is kind of trivial because you expect that uh, when you take your limit, if you have a limit at least in, at least in the in, in the massless uh, regime, you should converge to something scale invariant. So what I wanted to do at some point is try to assume scale invariance for K and try to identify K from this thing. This I think is a very interesting problem and it may have a solution. It may be that the only scale invariant possible limit is the green function. Um, okay, so uh, Peter and Sir Alan. Okay, if people start to push, uh, can you say something about? Okay, so for O n models with n larger or equal to one, I mean for n larger or equal to two, sorry, what we are going to miss is uh, we are going to be failing to use the random current representation. So what you need to use in this regime is the Bridges, Froelich, Spencer, or the Simonsic representation. It may be that it works. It's just that at this stage, you have a problem of uh, using what we call the switching lemma, which is going to be very important in the proof that we don't have. And this is actually something which was maybe not uh, very clear in the paper of Jörg Fröhlich. So uh, the difference between Eisenman result and Jörg result in 82 is that Eisenman uh, used the random current representation while Jörg use the bridges for this Spencer representation. So Jörg's result extends to spin ON model with N larger or equal to two. But let's be careful, it extends as long as you are looking at results that don't use the switching lemma in a crucial fashion. And as far as I know, triviality in dimension five and more doesn't require that. We, we will see that in, uh, we will see that on, uh, on Thursday that you don't use uh, yeah, you, you are right, uh, Roland. I mean, you still need uh, you still need FKG. Uh, I mean, you still need, still need Griffiths uh, uh, inequality. You are right. Um, so you, as long as it doesn't use the switching lemma, it works. So, for instance, triviality works in dimension five and more. But the exponent gamma, so the the, the susceptibility thing. At least I don't know how to do it only using uh, the, the Bridges for this Spencer uh, thing. I mean, Roland and I had a discussion like that a few years ago. Maybe Roland now knows how to do it. But uh, even though it's claimed in your uh, paper, I do think that when you dive into the proof, when you want to write fully the proof, you, you end up with difficulties. I think that it's going to be the same problem for 4D triviality that as far as I know, the only proof, which is our proof, does require the, the, the uh, switching lemma in a very, very crucial fashion. 
So I but don't know a, how to get. Yeah. There's a random current like representation for ON models that I saw recently on Archive by yeah. uh, Ben Lees and Lorenzo Taji. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they have a color switching lemma. I mean, they just look at the two point function. Uh, yeah. But do you have any comments about that? Uh, my comment is that you are coming in September and we are going to discuss that, right? <laughs> no, I mean, clearly, I think that there, there is an opening uh, to do n equal to. Of course, n larger than two, strictly, you lose all the correlation inequalities there. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, thinking it's doable, but n equal to, I, I guess uh, it's reasonable to try at least. That's, uh, that's clear. Yeah. Um, Link to Discord, Roland saving me, perfect. Are there other questions? Yeah, so I think uh, Anders was just saying, perhaps it's good to, um, thank you again. Anders, can we, can we un un unmute everybody else again or? <laughs> it's gonna make everybody uncomfortable. You're gonna hear people screaming at each other. <laughs> you, you get in the intimacy. No, I think people, they still right? have to click actively that they're <laughs> unmute. So let's clap ah, again. Okay. Thank you very much.